Hello, uh, I'm uh, Dean Takahashi uh, back again, uh, lead writer for GameSpeed at VentureBeat. Uh, I'm based in the uh, San Francisco area, and I've been writing about the game industry for more than uh, 20 years. I run the GamesBeat conferences, and our next one takes place on uh, October 5th and 6th in uh, San Francisco. And uh, Richard Garriott here has had a uh, wonderful life in the video games. Uh, but he's also lived what seems like uh, many lives uh, outside of video games uh, with enough adventures for five or six lifetimes. Um, he uh, coached a featherweight boxing champion. Uh, he almost starved in a journey on the Amazon River. Uh, he almost had a fatal rock climbing accident. Uh, he had to pull a gun on an overly enthusiastic fan who broke Beware. into his home. Yeah. Uh, uh, yet he creates legendary haunted houses for Halloween, uh, welcoming everybody into his home in, in Austin as well. Uh, and like his father before him, Richard journeyed into space. Um, and while he was up there, he showed a secret message to Tabula Rasa fans uh, while on a communications link back to Earth. And he journeyed to the bottom of the sea to get a close-up look at the Titanic as well. So that's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Been around a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah. So th those are all very interesting things, and I hope we uh, digress a little uh, into some of those stories. But our, our main purpose here is to talk about Richard's life in games. Uh, and uh, you started very early in the 1980s, uh, making your first Ultima game when you were in high school. Uh, so that was a, a momentous time. Uh, you wrote about it in your, your book here, uh, Explore, Create. Uh, and you've progressed over the years through work at Origin, uh, Electronic Arts, Destination Games, NCSoft, and now Portalarium. Uh, so maybe tell us about those early days and, and the eras uh, you've seen in gaming. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I'm just about the right age to uh, have uh, you know come of age in high school, mm -hmm. you know, right as personal computers were invented. Uh, in fact, before I released the first Ultima, I had written a series of games on a teletype, so an uh, electromechanical typewriter connected with an acoustic modem to a machine that was still using core memory, so a uh, physical you know little donuts of uh, ferrous material to store individual bits. Uh, so very, very primitive. But if you look at these games I made in the 1970s, uh, other than using asterisks for walls and spaces for corridors, they were, they were still uh, very obviously, at least to me, the prequels of Ultima. And, uh, uh, and, and so, so starting when I did, you know, it, it's interesting that at the age of 19, when I began to publish games, uh, uh, I was, of course, one of the only people at that time. But as I've gotten older, there's always been waves of new young people getting into the industry. So while there's a few gray hair folks out here that uh, uh, go back to that, those same earliest days, uh, I've sort of perpetually been one of the oldest people in the industry, uh, even when I was only you know, 21 or 22 years old. But, uh, but it, was a, it was a wonderful time to get started because it, let, it allowed myself and others who go back to that period to help set some of the standards of different genres and terminology uh, and even tools and techniques that have been used uh, and evolved uh, since. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, how, do you, how do you use some of the lows and the, uh, the highs uh, in hindsight? This yeah. Longer. Well, you know, so so if you've I've, I've been been making games now, you know, uh, let's say 80s, 90s, zeros, and so 37, almost 40 years of uh, published games, mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately, I've had uh, uh, you know some some great highs through that. You know, if I look at my my favorite games down through the years, I would have to pick uh, Ultima 4, Ultima 7, and Ultima Online as as uh, highlights, and. Uh, and as I contrast the highs versus the lows, it's interesting, those three highs that I mentioned, and uh, if any of you have played Ultimas, um, I would guess that 4, 7, and UO might also be on many other people's short lists. But uh, those, all three of those were games that when I started making it, it was very difficult to convince people around me that it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. 
because I was deviating significantly from what was already popular or even often what was popular within my own games. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I would get advice against mm -hmm. uh, doing those games for one reason or another. They grew that uh, on Ultima 4 there. Yeah, for example, in Ultima 4, you know, Ultima 3 had been my first origin, my, the publisher my brother and I started. It was our first published product. Mm -hmm. And so we would get, you know, fan mail that, that basically described how people were playing. And while I thought people were being heroic, what they would write in and they would say, hey, I love playing the game and, you know, defeating the bad guy. But, I, but how they had fun playing was killing all the NPCs in the game, killing my character, Lord British, in the game, stealing from all the shops, basically min maxing the gaming system to become powerful to win mm -hmm. which i was which as i read that 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 feedback i went well th they're not being heroic at all they're they're lying and cheating and stealing so i'm mm -hmm. going to stop that i'm going to force them to be virtuous mm -hmm. in order to succeed mm -hmm. uh that's when uh, i invented the you know, you know adopted uh, the, the word avatar from uh, you know religious context that obviously has now become uh, quite common Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and I put kind of virtual karma in the game, uh, but literally, you know, my brother, my family, a lot of the folks around me thought it was a terrible mistake to mm -hmm. to hear feedback from players of this is why they like my game, and immediately tell them that I am no longer going to let them play the game that way. <laughs> uh, and yet, it was sort of the first number one best-selling game I did. Mm -hmm. And similar with Ultima Seven in the but very they had to, detail. They had to make moral choices basically they had to behave better to succeed exactly. in the game right yeah, yeah exactly well in fact very specifically um you know i uh, uh when you when you look at uh, the way i did this I, I introduced sort of a moral philosophy so i did a lot of research on uh, uh moral philosophy and uh, uh i basically tried to seduce players into behaving badly and then would keep a kind of karma uh, registry behind their behavior. And then later, if they'd been lying and cheating and stealing, which most everybody had been, uh, the players, that the, the characters that they'd been stealing from, uh, who they now needed help from, would say, you know, I'd love to help the hero, but you're the most dis dishonest, thieving scumbag I've ever mm -hmm. met, so I'm not helping you. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 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 and that actually turned out to be a very uh, powerful, uh, I think, game mechanic and a kind of a revelation to uh, uh, players and even how uh, role-playing games could uh, could be generated. Mm -hmm. So this research you do, uh, you, you do it for almost you know every every game there, and um, you basically had to teach yourself. You had to be a polymath, right? Uh, Th yeah, that's right. Well, in fact, mm -hmm. I, I would, if you look at my uh, educational career, um, you know, not only am I a college dropout. Mm -hmm. But uh, even when I was in school and grade school and high school, I was not a particularly good student. I mean, I, I did independent projects very well. I was a great science fair competitor, but I did not, uh, uh, you know, I was not uh, uh, particularly studious in mm -hmm. English, history, philosophy, you know, name the subject. Um, but as soon as I had application for it, as soon as I realized that, you know, if I'm going to include moral philosophy in a game, I, I really need to understand moral philosophy. I became a voracious uh, mm -hmm. reader and consumer of a wide variety of topics. And so f for pretty much for every game, now I, under I get an entire new library of subject matter, digest it thoroughly, and then try to do original creation around that topic. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like uh, as far as inspiration goes, your, your main inspiration is J.R.R. Tolkien and The Lord of the Rings. That's <laughs> definitely the foundation. <laughs> so uh, you know, in fact, I, in, my, in my best uh, imagination of myself, I uh, think of myself as a Tolkien style game designer. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that when I say that is, uh, you know, my you know, as soon as I started reading Tolkien's works, I personally at least uh, it came to the belief that, you know, that his understanding of the world in which his characters were living mm -hmm. uh, was not, not just deep, but astoundingly deep, you know, the, the, the layers upon layers of reality crafting that he had done for the world mm -hmm. before he even unleashed his characters into the world, um, I was constantly impressed with. So after reading The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and mm -hmm. then I went back and read The Silmarillion, then I went back and read all the unfinished works, and then I went back and uh, read English translations of the Kalevala, the kind of Finnish oral mm -hmm. histories that inspired a lot of 
his unfinished works and then the, the pieces that were built on top of it. And, uh, and so I sort of believe that same way. And so I, I believe that uh, by researching deeply the worlds that we are crafting, uh, it, 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 it creates meaning and context and depth within the story we eventually layer on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sam Lake uh, from Remedy uh, said something similar yesterday as well. And um, I, I guess in your book, uh, Tolkien um, provided you with a very inspirational quote, I guess, about uh, uh, how he felt like he created languages for his worlds, and then the stories came from that process, or came from those languages, I guess, right? And this is something you do in your games as well? You well, you know, in fact, if, if you look at uh, the cloth maps mm -hmm. that uh, Ultimas are, are well known to have uh, uh, you know, had as one of the anchor pieces that you get in the, with the box. Um, you know, I started with a, well, in fact, it, it, for those of you, I presume most all of you have read uh, The Hobbit mm -hmm. and, uh, and may have had a similar moment that, like I did when you had seen the map with this strange writing on it that you move on and then only you know, a chapter or two into the book do you realize that that writing is not just a scribble. Mm -hmm. It is uh, real words that in fact are quite easy to read uh, because it's made in this runic language that is an easy letter for letter cipher into English. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to me that was a great revelation to realize this was not just made up, it uh, had a sense of truth to it. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to the same source he did, the Druidic runes, to create a slight variation of my own for Ultima. But I have kept that uh, to where I have research projects going on to this day about symbolic languages, phonetic languages, uh, and other structures that try to improve how to present languages in a game context. Mm -hmm. For example, um, runic is great if you speak English, mm -hmm. but is terrible if you speak Japanese because you first have to convert it from runic into English characters to get an English word, then translate the English word into whatever your domestic language is. And so uh, something that was very easy for an American became doubly difficult for every, anyone else on earth. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, and so solving that problem, making universal languages that, that, are, that both create the sense of mystery and depth in the, in the game world, but don't increase the difficulty to understand for foreigners uh, has kind of been one of my pet projects mm -hmm. that I still work on to this day. So your, your brother Robert uh, works with you on a lot of these, these games and he's the, the business guy, I guess, yeah. right? And uh, um, I can imagine uh, him uh, saying something like, uh, you know, isn't this a little extreme, uh, you know, to, to have to create a, a language uh, before you get started on the, the game that we need to ship uh, pretty soon? Well, unquestionably, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, you know, if we're, if, if we're in a business of making games, you know, we, you, it's inevitable that you have both the artistic desire to create great art, which uh, is unhampered by uh, time, money, and uh, the need to return value in a, some artistic purity. But of course, if you're doing it as a business, you have to be able to plan for it, uh, afford to create it, uh, have it complete before you run out of money, and then ultimately generate enough money to, get to, uh, to sustain profitability and the opportunity to do another. And so, you know, that's uh, one of the great challenges of, of, of any creative art mm -hmm. is, to, uh, is to layer those two things together. But uh, in this case, for my brother and I, um, you know, we who, who work together, uh, he's technically retired now, mm -hmm. but for 30 years of, or 35 years, we were business partners. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, interplay, I think, actually helped us in, mm -hmm. the, in the long run to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. Now your book has a, a few details about this that we didn't really always know, I guess. Uh, uh, you guys almost went out of business uh, before publishing uh, Ultima 5? Well, yeah, well, well, for example, one of the, you know, you, at the very beginning we talked about the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's actually very important lessons that come out of the lows. Mm -hmm. For example, um, the first machine that I was particularly enamored with was the Apple II. And so, uh, you know, most of the early Ultimas I developed on the Apple II. Um, when other platforms came out, 
I would make my own judgment as to whether I thought they would eventually supersede or do less well than Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, when the IBM PC first came out, mm -hmm. the original version of the IBM PC in America had a little bit faster processor, had a little bit more memory, but it had this chiclet style keyboard that I thought was you know, <laughs> not really good to interact with. It, uh, I thought the DOS operating system you know, was confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just felt that Apple had a strong enough lead mm -hmm. that Apple would ultimately win the day. Mm -hmm. And so I kept Ultima 5 as well as most of our other projects that Origin was developing mm -hmm. focused on Apple first and then porting it to a variety of other platforms. And uh, about halfway through the development of Ultima 5 and three or four other projects, mm -hmm. it became obvious that the Apple market had crashed. Mm -hmm. The PC clone market had you know, rapidly become dominant. Mm -hmm. And we had no uh, employees that were working on the IBM PC. So we were going to release a bunch of games that had no market. And so we knew that would put us out of business, that uh, we, we had to become a PC first company. And so we actually had to hire a whole bunch of new employees. We had to delay the release of a wide number of games, all of our games. Uh, and then we could do a simple calculus to go, you know, we were expecting this money, this revenue to come in at the end of this one particular year. And that was now pushed out by six months or more. And we did the calculation, went, you know, we're not going to survive till that point in time. And so we, we looked into a bank loan to how much money we could borrow, which wouldn't take us to the point we needed. Mm -hmm. And I had just built my first home uh, mm -hmm. in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. and, but hadn't paid for it yet, uh, so I had a construction loan. And so to bridge to the ship date of Ultima 5, I had to put my house up as, as a, uh, uh, you know, on the line collateral, for, yeah. for mm -hmm. uh, collateral. Mm -hmm. had to, we, both my brother and I went millions of dollars in debt with personal loans and we had to uh, pre-sell the game. We had, we had spent all the money we had in the bank. So we, we literally set up a, if we had not shipped Ultima 5 on time and it was not successful, not only would we have been out of business, but all the value that I ever created up till that point in time, the industry would be gone and I'd have a huge amount of debt. Mm -hmm. uh, Ultima 5, by the way, was the only game I think I've ever shipped on time <laughs> <laughs> because of that pressure. <laughs> uh -huh. So it was a stressful, stressful time, and uh, you actually got in a fist fight with your brother in the office uh, in front That's of your true. employees, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, so Robert and I were notorious for arguing, so, uh, because we're brothers. Uh, but there was one time this came to a particular head where if we were, if we were, I was in his office arguing about something neither of us remember what was, but I'm sure I was right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and as I was angrily leaving the room, I picked up the uh, pencil off the table that my brother insisted was his pencil, so I should leave it behind. And we not only we began to argue about the ownership of this pencil, but that even broke into a brawl. So we literally began to physically fight over the who has this pencil. Uh, that ultimately the pencil broke, and then both of us just broke out laughing, just because we obviously saw the you know stupidity of the whole circumstance. And we went ha 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 ha, and immediately forgot why the argument existed at all. But as soon as we opened the door from his office all of the other employees of the company had their heads out of their office going like, oh my gosh, you know, what is happening to the company? You know, is there, there must be something really profoundly wrong uh, that, <laughs> uh, you know, is coming down the pipe. But, uh, uh, but that, was sort of, that was sort of the pinnacle of our brotherly fights. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we both matured a bit after that day and uh, things, our, our business relationship has got much better. Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> Um, so uh, we mentioned a few of the first, you, you're coining the term avatar, you're creating original languages, putting moral choices in games, uh, doing, you know, Ultima Online, the MMO, um, but you also uh, created the earliest, uh, one of the earliest VR prototypes called the Nauseator. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, when we, when we first started Origin, mm -hmm. the reason we picked the name Origin was we weren't sure if we would only make games. You know, at, at that point in time, this was, you know, before DOS. This was, you know, this is, you know, operating systems were terrible and we were having to rewrite large portions of it just to make games work. And so we thought, you know, we, you never know, we might make operating systems. 
We, uh, if you look at the Apple II, it was both simple hardware, but it had ports that you could plug things into. And so we actually built the prototype of a dual joystick for an Apple II to maybe do games like Crazy Climber. Um, and in my parents' garage, we built the Nauseator. <laughs> and the Nauseator was a giant wooden uh, 360 degree uh, multi-axis simulator that uh, uh, could free tumble in all dimensions. We got it to the point where it had a, a chair in it that you could strap into, and we were in the middle of putting electronics, or we'd just get, we were preparing to put electronics in it, when we decided that this was far too dangerous <laughs> to continue. Uh, because this thing weighed, you know, a couple thousand pounds. It had, you know, structural beams that would move past each other, you know, with an inch of clearance that, you know, if, if you put your finger anywhere near it, we realized it would be taking body parts off. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's when we decided that, you know, maybe we should just focus on the software side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but we did like getting in the nauseator. And the reason why we called it the nauseator is uh, we would put people in it and just sort of let it free tumble and, you know, endanger yourself by manually speeding it up from the outside. And you, had, you had no safety belts in it, right? The, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was not safe in, <laughs> in any way you might consider the term safe. Uh, but it also had a habit of you'd get out of it feeling all right, but within about two or three minutes of being out, you would tend to feel sick, mm -hmm. and so we called it the nauseator. But it started this tradition of trying something new or being innovative. You know that's true. In fact, you know, if I look back at my career, one of the Especially in the early days, one of the things that um, I think was key to my success was that with each new product, uh, we had learned so much from doing the, fir the earlier product that we sort of set all the code, uh, all the art, uh, all the design aside mm -hmm. and started fresh trying to make something that it was as, as significantly better than the predecessor as possible. Uh, and I didn't do that because I thought it was a good marketing idea. I did it just because uh, I was really now unsatisfied with, <coughs> with what had just come before. And, uh, but if you look at my competitors back in the day, so like when, when Ultima first came out, a couple of the other really great games were out at that time were things like Wizardry, and then soon after Bard's Tale and Might and Magic. And each Ultima was measurably better than its predecessor. You know, it had twice as many tiles. It went from being in basic to being an assembly language. It, uh, you know, the amount of RAM it used, the storage media used, all those things, you know, increased measurably significantly. Um, well, for a lot of my competitors, if they had a, th their original games often outsold my original games, but what they would do with their sequel is they would change the art, add some new monsters, add a new story, but technologically, it was still very similar to the original. And so what often happened for them is they would sell to a subset of the people who bought and enjoyed the previous game. Mm -hmm. My games mm -hmm. were, I, I would argue, radically better each time. And so they sold to a larger and larger and larger fan base with each uh, iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while that started as an accident, uh, it became purposeful in my uh, plans for how to make games going forward. Mm -hmm. It seems like a pattern Ubisoft has where they, they introduce a new game at the beginning of some platform, like, uh, you know, the Wii U comes out or something, and, and they hope that, uh, say, the sequels are the ones that turn out to make them real money. I guess, uh, interesting kind of approach. Well, yeah, in fact, uh, uh, I'm going to talk this afternoon also about uh, intellectual property development, and that's one of the things that uh, I'll, I'll talk about this afternoon is my belief that it's at the introduction moment of a new platform mm -hmm. that is the moment where you can create new intellectual property. Um, mm -hmm. what, what Ultima, Wizardry, Might Magic, all those things were created at the beginning of, uh, in this case, all platforms, but you know, a, a platform. But once a platform matures, mm -hmm. uh, you have the reverse problem. When, once you already have Ultima, Wizardry, Might Magic, and Bard's Tale, you know, yet another role-playing game that you've never heard of is harder to market. Mm -hmm. And so that's when people start to buy licenses. So mm -hmm. you want to do instead to compete with those, you buy Lord of the Rings or you buy Star Wars or you buy some other license to break through the chaff. 
-hmm. But those people that do that don't own the IP themselves at that point. Mm -hmm. But it's a way to get their game to sell well despite the fact they don't own the IP. So I, I think as game creators, uh, the real opportunity is you, you want to create IP, you want to own the IP, the place and time to do it is when you have the blue ocean mm -hmm. of a new platform where existing powerful IPs are not already present. Mm -hmm. uh, and these windows just open and close you know, periodically ar around us. So mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you, you have to take advantage of those moments. Mm -hmm. So you guys built Origin, uh, you, you sold it to EA, and um, you also built uh, Destination Games and, and sold it to NCSoft. And it, it seems like there's this pattern of where seasoned game developers uh, you know, they build a company, they sell it, uh, they make that brand go as far as they can, and then they leave and uh, become an independent uh, developer again. And I, I kind of curious what you think of this whole life cycle. Right? Yeah, well, so what I, what I find interesting about having had such a long time mm -hmm. in this industry is to see how there's a, a, a cycle that I believe will likely continue forever. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, if you know, the, the first era of games, um, the kind of retail box games with mostly solo player games, uh, uh, you, you know, it is, uh, you know, it, in, the, in the early days, there were lots of companies, of course. Uh, and, and Origin was one of the top 10, always, mm -hmm. usually number 10 in the mm -hmm. top 10. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But we were still very pleased and proud. Origin did very well. We produced a lot of really great games. We made plenty of money with it. But because we're selling at retail, as the retail business matures, the, the buyer for Walmart or Target or Amazon or anyone that you might think of, they don't want to buy from a hundred different companies they, or distributors. They only want to buy from a few. And they want to make sure that if they buy a product from, say, Origin, that they can stock balance to where if they buy one that doesn't sell well, they want to be able to return that and buy something else instead. And what that means is that the shelf space per company uh, uh, becomes smaller and smaller. You, you basically have to buy your shelf space. And so that means unless you're one of the top five, you really don't get access to the, 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 the spine-edged shelf space to sell product. And so the, the maturing distribution sort of forced out anybody that wasn't a top three to five company. And then when things go digitally online, people go like, hooray, we no longer have to worry about you know, the shelf space. But as that matures, you have the same problem, but in a new form. You know, uh, a, a few people today were talking about the hundreds of games that come out you know, uh, monthly, if not daily. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just a constant stream of new products coming out. And so while on one hand, it's easy to publish or make it physically present, that does not mean that anybody's eyeballs are gonna be looking at it. And the only way to get people's eyeballs to look at it is if you're part of an ecosystem of other eyeballs of similar game interest uh, that you can either buy your way into or partner your way into. And so that effectively means shelf space again. The concept is very similar. And, uh, and, and so every time the new platforms come into existence, it opens up again. Not only can you make new IP, uh, but there's new companies that come into existence. Like, for example, I would argue that even though Origin gave Electronic Arts Ultima Online one of the first great large-scale MMOs. They didn't believe in the model. They thought the subscription-based model, they were gun-shy to start it. And so instead of making Wing Commander Online and Crusader Online, they paused. Mm -hmm. And that gave the opening for new companies like Blizzard, who was already a strong developer, but then they came in and NCSoft came in and uh, you know, Sony Online came in. All these other companies came in to dominate this new market segment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think it was really sort of a missed opportunity for, for EA to do that. So every new platform, every new, every new kind of uh, method of distribution uh, is an opportunity not only to create new intellectual property, but also to create new companies to compete with the older companies that might be too slow to turn mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and dominate that new segment. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your own sort of rearview mirror of uh, Tabula Rasa and you know, how that whole uh, project? Uh, well, well, you know, it's out. interesting. I, I mentioned my three favorite releases were mm -hmm. Ultima 4, Ultima 7, Ultima Online. Mm -hmm. The games that, despite resistance, 
me and the team stayed the course with our beliefs and got it out as we planned it. Mm -hmm. The two rockiest releases I've had were Ultima 8 and Tabula Rasa. And in both of those cases, they had a very similar problem. Mm -hmm. And that problem was largely described as uh, a strong difference of opinion between me or the team mm -hmm. and the publisher. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not unusual. I've had differences before. But what in both of those cases we did is we, we did what the publisher told us to do. You know, in, in the case of Ultima 8, you know, we, we had, Ultima 7 had been the first product we did as part of EA, but it was mostly finished before we became part of EA. But when we became part of EA, they're used to, EA is in the business serve, the, you know, their dominant business is selling sports games mm -hmm. that they do on a yearly cadence. And so every year they release a football game at the beginning of football season. And it's every year it's a little bit better than it was last year because they've got some new features in, but they always make the ship date of, of football season. So their advice to us was, you have to ship on time. It's more important to ship when we expect you to ship than it is to have all the bells and whistles and things that you think need to be there. And they believe they have data to prove it. And they now own me. And so I listened. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I cut the game to try to fit their schedule or the, the schedule we had agreed to. And that was a tragic mistake. Mm. It means the game shipped unfinished, it fish, finished, fi uh, shipped buggy, uh, unrefined. Uh, and with Tabula Rasa, we had a similar issue, but it, it, instead of being at the end, it was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, we were going to create a game that would hopefully sell well in both Korea and the United States. And for two years, we kept shipping game designs and art to Korea, and, and art style to Korea. And for two years, we would get feedback saying, no, we don't think this is right for Korea. And, and we, here we are burning time and lots of money, m not really starting at all uh, because we never could uh, understand what they wanted from us or provide them something they were happy with. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, we just said, we're, we can't make a game for you. We're going to make a game for ourselves. We're going to make the game that we believe we should make for the audience we know uh, and we hope it sells well somewhere else, but, but we have to just make the game we know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that two years of kind of false starts mm -hmm. set the project behind in time and in budget mm -hmm. uh, in a, at a level to where the pressure to ship now began, you know, frankly, before we got started, really. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very difficult game to, to finish, mm -hmm. again, because of that uh, unclean, start of the vision. Mm -hmm. uh, now in the end, for both Ultimate and, and Tabula Rasa, I'm actually in the end very happy with those games mm -hmm. once they were polished and patched and rectified. But by then it's too late for the marketing window to, uh, mm -hmm. to sweep it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I'm, not a, I'm not entirely sure what the exact lessons are to pass on for that, but, mm -hmm. you know, but having a good, clean, strong vision from the start and standing by it till you finish I think is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. I've at least found for me that if you allow yourself to wander or if you allow your publisher to make you wander, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. But this did lead you to, to being, uh, becoming an indie again and to, to sort of uh, take advantage of this uh, Kickstarter era, right? So um, uh, tell us about what that transition was like then going, going back to indie. Well, you know, what, what I, another, my, one of my takeaways from uh, now having, you know, completed two cycles of being independent for a decade and then being part of a company for a decade mm -hmm. um, is as follows. The, uh, uh, I've already told you that the pressure to go from small to big is because of uh, distribution, uh, uh, comp competition for distribution. The... Convert, once you are big, you have an opposite problem, which goes back again to one of the reasons why I think a lot of big companies uh, are, are slow to turn. They are, by their very nature, risk averse. They acquire new properties. They acquire new gameplay. But what they're not good at doing is inventing new properties, inventing new gameplay. Um, you know, if, if they're going to put $100 million or, or, or more into a product, it really needs to succeed. They, you know, their their stock will suffer, you know, dramatically if they fail, 
at one of these giant sequels they're doing. And so they're very risk averse. They, they need to have some level of predictability and reliability in that, in that release schedule. So it, it shouldn't be surprising to us that if you end up working with a big company, you'll be working with big properties that you are evolving but not taking giant risks with. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you want to go do something new, which I think a lot of us do, at least I, I mean, that's where I get my, a lot of my enjoyment, uh, you sort of need to go back off on your own and, and start again small. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the cycle of small to large, small to large is uh, 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 understandable and something I sort of now embrace. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, we said, okay, we, we know we want to go off and, and uh, create sort of a spiritual successor to, uh, uh, to what had been doing before in the Ultima series. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to change it up significantly. We want to change the technolo technological basis to this thing we call selective multiplayer. Um, now with Shroud of the Avatar. This is in Shroud of the Avatar yeah. in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so we knew we would be taking risks with the model that large publishers you know, would have a difficult time embracing. And, uh, but yet games now are not something you can do small by yourself. You still need, you need more cash in your pocket to even make a modest game than was true 20 years ago. And so that's when we discovered or you know, became an early participant in crowdfunding. So Shroud of the Avatar is actually the number two crowdfunded game in history. It's a distant number two uh, <laughs> behind uh, Star Citizen, who's mm -hmm. you know, 10 times bigger than we are. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and now we're actually at the point where we're, we're going to be launching it later this year. And so now we're looking to be grow into becoming also a publisher for the first time. We've been purely a developer mm -hmm. until now. And so we're actually doing a, another type of crowdfunding that didn't exist when we started, it's uh, equity crowdfunding with a Seed Invest, company yeah. called Seed Invest. Mm -hmm. And so now people can actually directly invest in the company as we grow to being a publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think this will be a great model for this, for this size and this time. Mm -hmm. We think this is a great model. But, uh, but for us to really succeed as a company, we're not only going to grow as a publisher for Shroud of the Avatar, but we're going to grow to publish other creators of worlds uh, products uh, uh, and and I would anticipate you know in, in five years or so that uh, we may feel the pinch or the squeeze to partner up with the end uh, much larger companies mm -hmm. I have a, a lot more questions but I, I think we're running close to being out of time as uh, so our, our jump to the, the final one here um, so what, what's your view of the future and uh, your your views on things like VR and beyond uh, well you know uh, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that my, my hardware prediction was very bad, at, you know, Apple versus PC. And so by no means do I believe I can, I, I've become very platform agnostic. You know, whatever platforms the players decide they want to play on, then, you know, we need to provide them entertainment on that platform. Um, and, but I've also noted that there's these opportunities that if you can, you can build new companies, you can build new intellectual property as new platforms emerge. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you think about virtual reality, I am personally simultaneously a huge fan. You know, I would love for it to succeed. I've, I've owned VR hardware back in the Apple II days. There was a really terrible VR goggle back in the Apple II days that had these <laughs> postage stamp monitors in front of your eyes with terrible lag time, but it, you know, it was, and very low resolution graphics. Um, and, and it was cool, but obviously nowhere near ready. And we thought, you know, give it five or 10 years, it's gonna be great. And this was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, Every five or 10 years, new hardware's come <laughs> out, and I've gone like, wow, this is really close, but give it five or 10 years, it'll be great. <laughs> and uh, my personal opinion on the current state of VR is that unfortunately, we're still not quite there yet. Uh, it makes great demos. I have a lot of the hardware at home. My children love to kind of you know, look around in it briefly, but I don't see the economics yet to back it up. I think that you know, we still can't move through the world quite fluidly enough. I think we still have this problem of having to suit up and take it off uh, and fee the freedom of moving around in space when you're tethered. Uh, I think you know, the peripheral view is still a problem. I think that seeing your hands is still a problem. I think feeling like I have clubs for hands to interact with the world is still a bit of a problem. Uh, and all those things are solvable and there's people working on it. And there's some really cool stuff to do in VR. I mean, it's really cool. What I don't see is anything even remotely close to the economics 
of purchases happening that are necessary to justify the billions of dollars that are being put into hardware. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm fearful that we're uh, going to see not only a short-term crash, but I at least personally don't see the path out mm -hmm. at the other end yet. Now, it doesn't mean that at any given day, someone you know, here in this building could have the solution that suddenly magically fixes all this and suddenly VR is, is, has reached its stride and is, 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 is the economic powerhouse of the future. And I presume that someday that, that will, will happen and I hope to be a part of it and catch it soon enough to do my own intellectual property development at that time. Mm -hmm. I just think uh, uh, that a lot of the hype is dramatically uh, in front of the practical realities of making money. Mm -hmm. Well, like your, your father, you, you suited up and you, you went into space and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe uh, suiting up and going into VR is, uh, is, is going to be the next best thing someday. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I, there's nothing I would enjoy more than creating and experiencing you know, uh, things as close to the matrix as you know, we can possibly create. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I think we're done. Uh, do we have any time for questions? Or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we'll take a, a question then. Yeah. Uh, right here in the red. <coughs> it's the microphone coming around. Right. Down the center aisle. I see everyone coming down behind you here in just a second. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, hello. Uh, you told us that uh, the market of the MMOs punishes you so hard. Uh, what do you think about the rebound? of Final Fantasy XIV that was almost unplayable in his first version and Square Enix make uh, another game and they rebound of, uh, of an horrible situation at the beginning. Yeah, you know, you know when you look at um, business models and platforms and even uh, individual releases in a series of games, uh, I can't tell you how many times people have told me about the death of the future of any, any one of those categories. For example, pretty much my whole career, I've been told that PC games are dead. And, you know, mm -hmm. ev every two years I'm told PC games are dead, you need to get out of developing for the PC, and I still develop for the PC, and I'm still quite content for it. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been told that medieval fantasy is dead. You know, either when Star Wars, the movie came out, people are saying, oh, it's gotta be science fiction or nothing. Or when The Matrix came out, it's gotta be modern, people in trench coats and sunglasses or nothing. And, uh, you know, EA told me, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, nobody wants to play a man running around in tights. You know, they really wanna look cool with a leather, leather jacket, you know, and, and, uh, and, and then similarly, you know, if you have one hiccup in a game release, people assume that that whole game product line is now washed up and dead. Um, but pretty, you know, and, and when, people are, when people are telling you that and they're powerful people, powerful partners, you know, people in charge of your economic future, it's, it's hard not to pay attention and, and think of hard about this advice they're giving you because they're, 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 they're giving to you in a well-meant way. They're just wrong. And, uh, uh, and so what I've learned at least is to, you know, as a game developer, it's important not to just stay, stay with your plan because it was your plan, you know, because that's the way you started. But if you really believe it, if you've, if you've listened to the feedback and you've done your research and you, you believe you have something compelling to do, uh, ignore that feedback. You, the, the best thing you can do is, is stand your ground. I mean, and it doesn't mean don't listen. It means take the input, you know, grind through uh, how this, reflect on how this, what this means to you, but then push on. And I think Final Fantasy is one of these great perennial properties that you know, has a foundation of incredible strength. And so sure, it's, it's perfectly fine to have a hiccup in, uh, you know, as you change features, as you experiment, as you try to move outside the confines of what you did before. It's understandable that some won't, won't be as strong, but that's no reason to give up on the property. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, take your, take your wounds, circle back and, and try again. Mm -hmm. Th 
Uh, okay, uh, quick Hi. question. Hi, yes, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for this interview. W what do you think about mobile, mobile games in general? Well, uh, so what's interesting is as a creator, at the moment, I'm still PC first. As a player, I am absolutely mobile first. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, you know, there are probably 10 games I ever played to completion on a PC. That's the games I really love. There's probably 10 that I would pick out. But they're all, they were all more than five years ago. I now have about 10 games on mobile that I just love and have played to completion multiple times, and they're all on mobile. What and so, sorry? What's your uh, so on mobile, so most recently it's uh, the Monument Valley 1 and 2. Uh, the, the very first game was one called Spider, was the first game on a mm -hmm. touch screen. Yeah. Uh, uh, Plants vs. Zombies, great favorite. Um, uh, many, you know, quite a few others, but uh, I'll show you offline here too. But yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.